And we're going to start our practice this evening um, with a meditation. And some of you may be familiar with this meditation. We've done it a lot in this Sangha, and that is um, the Tonglen meditation. It's a really nice meditation for us to be able to kind of um, have this opportunity for transformation and building resilience. So some of our meditations really help us focus our attention or increase spaciousness, incredible benefits. But with Tonglen, what we're doing is we're meeting what's here and what's difficult. And we're doing this visualized practice where we transform what's difficult into clear light. So for some folks, visualization is an easy practice, right? Like I say, close your eyes and imagine um, a beautiful desert beach and it comes to you. And for other folks, the visualization is a bit harder, not a problem at all. It's kind of a natural range of, that people experience. It's really about the practice and the imagination. Imagining inviting our hearts to be open, imagining meeting what's, what's difficult with a sense of real care. And to find our way into this practice, we'll actually start with the four preliminaries. And again, some folks here are familiar, but just as a kind of um, a reminder to us, these preliminary practices, some people will do them every single day for years and years. I often will spend a month with them before every practice. Um, and actually on my way here, they really kind of just started to rise up. I felt them really calling and wanting to share them with you all. They're quite simple, but they can help us with our motivation. They help us remember why we're here practicing together. And these are the preciousness of our human life. Just unbelievable. We get to be born into human bodies. And at this moment, all of us are well enough to be here receiving the teachings and to reflect on that and have a sense of both kind of readiness and appreciation. The other is um, one that is all too obvious for us all the time, which is everything is changing. And of course, there is uh, the inevitable reality of impermanence, that things are coming and going. So again, these are not meant to be an enormous bummer, but they're meant to really inspire us of why we should be practicing, as it is traditionally said, with our hair on fire uh, towards the Dharma. The third is the law of karma. Um, I like to think about it in really simple terms, you know, like what actions even that have happened prior in this day or in this week have impacted me in how I am here right now. Did I, for example, eat a huge burrito before I sat down? No, I didn't, friends. I made a wise choice tonight. Sometimes I do, right? There's an immediate cause and effect. And that's kind of a joke, but like, how do we really take into account that every single thing that we're doing in our um, body, speech, and mind has an impact, that ripple? And then the last of these um, preliminary practices is, you know, remembering kind of the insufficiency of the material world, uh, sometimes also known as the suffering of samsara. And I find this one just, you know, it, it's so annoyingly present. I really want to lose myself in the distractions. Like if my new like hooded sweatshirt would just truly create a lasting sense of joy, but actually it's kind of momentary. It's not always consistent, right? Of course the sweatshirt wears out. Maybe it accidentally gets thrown in the wash and turns the wrong color. So how do we really appreciate that if we're donating our energy, especially exclusively to things that are changing and things that are in the material world, or we are not going to do a lot for our own suffering. So I'll kind of invite these in, in the beginning. Um, and I just, before we go ahead and move towards practice, want to emphasize that within the Dharma Collective, our goal here is to create a space where we can have a sense of connection as much as possible, belonging. We, we can't force that on folks, but as May said, we are so happy to be together and people are coming here from different experiences and it's our real goal to kind of honor folks where they are. So in this course and the way that um, Chandra and I both teach, we invite folks to share and to reflect. And just as a reminder that every single thing that we're doing here is our practice. So the listening to others as they share, what we share, 
all of that we want to kind of imbue with compassion and care recognizing that we really just can't truly know what's going on for other people we don't know what's happened in our life we don't know a whole lot and having that sense of openness um, so that we really can engage in these teachings together we're always interested in feedback and ways that we can improve a sense of um, relative safety and okayness we can't predict everything as some folks know last week we had some uninvited interrupters and though the sangha handled it well um, you know we <clears throat> we do want to create a space where we can settle into our practice and maybe not have um, really loud music and dudes dancing around um, in the middle of it and so we do our very best to make this a space you can settle in and if there's more we can do please let us know really it is something We'd love to hear from you, handwritten note, email, pulling someone aside. We would, that would be really great for us. We can continue to open the space to more people. So, oh, thanks, Walt. Fire safety first. Also, yeah, that's not the kind of, not the kind of night we're looking for here. Yeah. And, um, oh yeah, you know, one thing I was thinking about is we have a beloved Sangha member um, who joins us a little later. And just for folks to know, you know, that the door will open, Mace is there. Um, she's here to help keep this space safe, but sometimes it can be um, a bit concerning, you know, so just as, a, just as a reminder that we are really taken care of in this space. So for your posture, yeah, feel free to take some space on the floor if you like to sit um, in a cross-legged. And if you're on a chair, find a position that you can reasonably hold without a whole lot of movement. We'll probably be practicing 25 or 30 minutes together. And with our posture, I don't know about you all, but I sat in front of a screen for too long today. So let's give ourselves, you know, the refreshment of either closing the eyes or having a lowered gaze. It can be nice to really invite our neck and shoulders to relax. And that could be like inhaling our shoulders up to our ears and then exhaling and down our back. Trying that twice more. Finding a position where you can really feel the uprightness of your spine. That helps us feel the vividness of our practice. Finding a place for the hands to rest in the lap or folded. It gives the shoulders a sense of ease. And I'm really softening through the face, through the chest and the belly. relaxing and softening through the eyes and the muscles in the face as a reminder to the whole body that we can be at stillness nothing we need to do with our face no expressions communication allowing our muscles to feel fully at ease our eyes having an inward gaze
Allow the attention and awareness to settle into the body. And tune in to the natural rhythm of the breath as though it were the very first time you noticed this beautiful, subtle rhythm of breath traveling in, breath traveling out. And as a way to help motivate our practice, we shift into these preliminaries. And the intention is to be with this phrase and idea. And once it's posed, to simply notice the reverberations in the mind and the heart and the body, not necessarily to think about it or engage with it energetically. So as we consider this first of the preliminaries, this precious human body, consider and reflect on anything you can notice right now that feels good in this body, where you can feel the preciousness. Maybe it's the breath. Maybe it's just the sense of being supported feeling at ease in the body. So for a couple moments, reflect on the preciousness of this human body right here and right now. Just one more moment, remembering that the preciousness isn't an evaluation of if we like this body the way it is or want it to be different. Just recognizing at this very fundamental level how precious it is to be able to see and hear and feel. And then shifting to this connection with a sense of everything changing. So apparent right now on this edge of fall, the days are getting shorter, the light has changed, the leaves are turning colors. So apparent in ourselves each day as we look in the mirror and 
notice that things are shifting and changing month by month, year by year. And of course, even greater difficulties, loss of people and places and situations. Letting that awareness of this truth of impermanence kind of mingle with our mind and heart and body. The recognition, the value of this very moment. And then shifting to this third of our preliminaries, considering this law of karma of action and reaction. Maybe we can consider something that has happened earlier today or this week, and feeling the impact of that right here and now. Or even thinking of being here, all the many different steps and situations that made us arrive here in this center tonight. And of course, considering the harmful effects, of some of our actions, some of which we know and some of which we don't know. The intention here really generating an understanding that everything we are doing, thinking and feeling, it matters, carries weight. These reflections are intended to really stoke the fire, invite us to feel motivated and diligent in our practice, training the heart and mind. And the last in this preliminary practice is the reflection on the limitations of the material world and seeking our pleasure and fulfillment through things that are always changing and shifting. Even recognizing some of the disappointment and pain when something shifts what was once a gain is a loss. What was once success feels like failure. All the myriad ways in which things are shifting and changing. And seeing how our own grasping onto them creates so much discomfort.
through these reflections. We then arouse our hearts in bodhicitta, an intention to wake up for the sake of all beings, recognizing this precious human life, the reality of impermanence, the interconnection of our actions and behaviors, and the limits of samsaric activity. giving ourselves here the anchor of the breath once again. And feeling just the subtle residue of these preliminary reflections and our intention and aspiration, following the breath as a kind of motivation and diligence. Remembering whenever you become aware that a distraction has carried you away. It's not a problem. It's part of the practice of developing this awareness of our mind, where it wanders. So gently coming back for a bit longer, connecting to our breath and our body, wherever it feels easy, the nostrils or the belly, slight rays of the chest.
as we shift into our Tonglen practice, we begin by connecting to a sense of the strength of our own heart. Imagining or feeling the innate capacity to love and be loved. Recognizing that our heart has been extended to others many, many, many times. Our heart has received love many, many, many times. And there is a strength and a power to that capacity to hold, extend, and receive love. We could start feeling or imagining that as a sense of warmth at the heart, a sense of light at the heart. This is intrinsic. It's our birthright, this ability to love and be loved. And in this practice, we engage with this love through the imaginal, strengthening the inner pathways by inviting in what's difficult to this radiant and warm light of the heart and transforming it there. It's traditionally said that before the Tonglen practice, we give ourselves a view, a flash of emptiness, of remembering that everything that is hard, that we will invite in to meet, it will change, it will shift. No matter how difficult it feels right now, how difficult it has been, it will change, it will shift. We're continuing to feel that sense of radiance and warmth and light at the heart center. Visualizing a, a sphere of light in front of the heart. And beginning with the Tonglen practice for ourselves. It's something that we may need some support in carrying. So taking a look around at our own heart, our own set of experiences we're working with right now. Maybe consider something that feels a little sticky or hard challenge in a relationship, struggle with health, a worry about resources. And try to bring one thing to mind. And in addition to the circumstances, really bring forth your own difficulty with it. The sadness or fear, the frustration, or shame. Igniting your own sense of care towards that part of you that is suffering and struggling. And imagining that struggle and giving it a visual form. Imagining it as the little swirling cloud of dark smoke hovering in front of the belly button. So we have the radiance at the heart and the dark smoke or fog right in front of the belly. And connecting to that heartfelt aspiration to be free from struggle and difficulty 
to feel relief, to feel ease, to feel peace. So imagine pouring out all that difficulty into that little cloud of smoke. And turning on that radiance in front of the heart. And with our next inhale, drawing in that little plume of smoke into the radiance at the heart. And exhale, transforming that smoke into clear light, like fog dissolving in the sun. Inhale, drawing in that difficulty and struggle. Exhale with that radiant light. May I be free. May I know peace. May I experience ease. And continuing with the rhythm that is comfortable for you, drawing in these tendrils of smoke and imagine transforming them completely and sending them out with that wish of compassion towards yourself. May I feel peace, may I know ease, may I be free. If it's hard to visualize or hard to feel, no problem at all. Still exercising that imaginal and compassionate capacity of inviting in and transforming. If it feels too hard or overwhelming at any time, just placing a hand on the belly and gently opening the eyes, focusing on the breath. Otherwise, just a bit longer here, really engaging with that heartfelt care a desire to alleviate our own suffering, to be free. Inhaling in the very last tendrils, fully ridding ourselves of the smoke of this experience for now. And taking a moment or two to just rest in this field of compassion, this body of compassion. Then shifting our attention and bringing to mind someone we care about who's going through a hard time, whose struggles are apparent to us. And bringing just one person, though there may be many, to mind. Considering their challenge or difficulty right now considering how it feels for them. And right on the edge of getting lost in their despair or their difficulty, we rise up with the strength of our compassion 
and invite that we could help and lighten their load just a bit. Imagine that we could pour their challenge and difficulty into the swirling cloud of dark smoke. Again, just hovering in front of the midline. Imagine them being able to relieve some of their suffering. Imagine being able to hold it for them, transform it. Again, touching into the heart, to the aspiration to alleviate this struggle and difficulty from this beloved being. And once again, using our breath, inviting this transformation. On the inhale, drawing in this tendril of smoke to the radiant light in front of the heart. And exhaling, may you be free. May you know peace. May you feel ease. Continuing to bring this heartfelt wish of compassion. Symbolically drawing in with the smoke, transforming at the radiance of the heart and extending in all directions the wish of compassion. And imagining that there are many people like our beloved being who may be going through similar struggles. And with a sense of strength and confidence in our wish of compassion, we bring these other beings to mind. So many, we could never know them. But imagining expanding and extending the heart so we could alleviate struggling and difficulty from so many beings, breath by breath. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale. May all these beings know peace and ease. May all these beings feel free. May all these beings be alleviated struggles and difficulties. Of course, this is an impossible task, alleviating the suffering of all beings, yet imagining it is training for the heart, making us ready and prepared to meet whatever we can with this strength of love and compassion when it's in our power to do so. So inviting in this training ground of compassion by imagining, alleviating, reducing some of this difficulty through drawing in these tendrils of smoke, extending out clear light.
Just one or two more breaths here. Those last little wisps and tendrils of smoke. And then coming back to the sense of the heart, this indelible strength and love. Breathing in and feeling the heart, breathing out, feeling the heart. Thanks for your practice. So we'll have a little time here to share any reflections or any questions on that practice. We did like a whole year of Tonglen in 2020. So now it's been a, been a minute. Anybody feel rusty for a lot of stuff to work through? <laughs> yeah. You want to share anything? Good, thank you. The talking stick. Who was it who said that last time? That was hilarious. I, um, yes, I, during the practice, I was thinking about the air. Not sure if it's on. Is it on? Is it on? Can you hear me? Oh, never mind. Okay, good. Um, and I really missed it. And um, the one thing I, I did struggle with there was a little rusty my beloved being sort of like puffed up with a huge cloud of smoke and I felt like it was like it reminded me of when Sandra talked about bad demons mm. eating a demon like this whole demon just like fleshed out and it was like uh, extra hard to breathe it all in <laughs> or something like I couldn't do it yeah um and so, yeah, that was just like one thing that came up. And other than that, I mean, I, I really love that practice. Yeah. And I appreciate you doing that. And the preliminary. So, with the loads on, it was nice to like, go back to that. Yeah. Preliminaries are, are, are kind of a, a mega bummer um, <laughs> at one level. And yet they're so helpful. Um, so I'm curious what happened with the, the big puff of smoke. Did it kind of resolve at some point or yeah, get it started to resolve and then I just sort of became less to like kind of it all yes and I do think it's it's a great um distinction it's like we don't actually breathe it in we kind of breathe it through so I like that distinction of having that that light outside of the heart and not in the heart um 
because I think it's like keeping it a little bit outside. One thing I notice is a lot of the beloved beings who come to us when we do these practices are people were already probably kind of, you know, at least enmeshed with, if not codependent with, right? And so taking on, right, their stuff can be, I mean, sorry, special friend we haven't seen in a while here in the Dharma Collective, um, taking on their um, their stuff in addition to our conditioning around it is hard. I actually think this practice is really good for boundaries, which sounds kind of um, unintuitive, but to be able to bring in and hold someone's difficulty and also like not take it on, not get subsumed. And I wonder if the big smoke is also kind of like falling inward. Like I think it's a good practice for us to notice when am I getting drenched in this person's difficulty and when can I kind of like see it and care and extend but not get pulled all the way in oh thank you, thank you. friends online I feel like my vision's getting worse or that thing moves moves back farther every week but um and go, oh yes mace I just am um, so glad we did this in 2020. And so, you know, the, uh, I've done it off and on over the years. And I was at, I was in a very difficult conversation with a colleague. Like they were telling me, they for some reason decided they needed to tell me really intense things about their life. Mm. Um, not, it wasn't difficult between the two of us. And I was like, I could feel myself starting to want to fix. And I was like, therapy and this, you know, and then I just said, no, my assistant on lens. Mm, and it yeah. was actually like in the moment, it was the boundary that was necessary because really all they needed was compassion. They were not coming to me to say, could you fix my problem? Um, and so I caught it and I was doing, I was like doing Tong Len while we were talking and mm. it was just, I felt so grateful because I feel like I was just able to like be more spacious mm. and I wasn't taking it like, kind of the horror of the story that we're telling amazing so very grateful so thank you thank you that's like yeah. testimony yeah testimony it worked when needed yeah if Beautiful. you remember yeah. yes <laughs> yeah like that right remembering that the most important thing is to remember the most important thing yeah. hard to do yeah anybody else and it's it's totally okay if like you're like, what? What am I visualizing? That's weird. I didn't get it. Um, no problem. But yeah, any other questions or thoughts, reflections on that practice? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know which, and it might be bad because I've only read a few. But um, which Puma Chodron book uh, goes uh, heavily into Tong Glen? God, this is like Jeopardy. Is it, is it, Pema is for 5,000. Is it, is it things fall apart when things fall apart? It is, right? No. Oh, okay. Let's do. Okay. Is it the places that scare me? We, 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 we did it through Lojong. Um, and there are many. Um, oh, you know what? Is Diane on? There's like a beautiful, um, there's a beautiful website that has Lojong slogans and all these different teachers writing about each of the 59. And Pema is one of the teachers every time. And so it says it like the book that she's writing from, but I can't, I can't remember it, but yeah, maybe we can, we can crowdsource that and get back to you. Yeah. No, cause that's really the Bodhisattva way of life. So there's not as much Tonglen. I know she has like a book. She I think it might be the places that scare you. Yeah. And she, you know, that, that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Any reflections on doing it tonight since, you know. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. It's not, it's not the practice everyone is wanting to go to all the time. It can be really hard to invite in, which is difficult. And people do really struggle with that. Like, I don't want to bring that in. Like, that's some toxic stuff. Like, I don't need that. And I think it's such an interesting practice because so much of our life is is meeting what life is offering, right? And and meeting it with this attitude of, okay, this is this too, right? And um, and being with it. And so to be able to practice it in this in this wonderful um lab laboratory of our own mind and heart it's just a really beautiful opportunity i do think and i heard pema on one of the recorded retreats i have of her talking about really writing down your whole list of people you want to work with getting ready so that you can kind of feel that going into the practice and um, that can be helpful there we go path of transformation any other thoughts or questions? Raise of hands. Who found it easier to feel the Tonglen for other people and not and not for themselves? Okay. It's only a couple honest people in the room. Just kidding. <laughs> so for the rest of you, you could feel that sense of care for yourself as strong or stronger than for others. Great. Okay. Any other questions on the practice or thoughts? Yes. So much about the tongue wave as much as about the preliminary. Yeah. And I find I struggle with um, being able to cherish things that are impermanent. It feels like if there's something that's going to be a short lived, like a job or a relationship or a little cup of coffee that I sort of don't care. I sort of detach from it. Yeah. Sort of don't care about it. And I feel like there's a another thing that I have to do, which has to do with cherishing it through the lives. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any wisdom about how to go about doing that. It just sort of feels like there's some way of how to connect easily to something, maybe even be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, I just really feel the the bittersweetness of that myself like I know like oh you don't like not wanting to really feel like the full measure of your love or care or excitement or joy because it's, it's going to go away and that's so tender um I will say you know we don't talk about the the positive aspect of Tonglen very often so there is the inviting in what's hard and transforming it but there's also inviting in what's good and like extending that as a rejoicing. <laughs> we can definitely do that. We've done that. We did a whole joy. Anyway, um, but yes, I think it's um, I think it's a really nice practice. And you know, with the sunset, with your cup of coffee, you know, with whatever it is, you know, having that sense of like really enjoying it and offering it up just like the sense of wow this is just yeah I, I saw a beautiful sunset last night and had that that pang of oh this is just like too beautiful and this is just too perfect of a moment it was also good waves Jimmy sorry um <laughs> it was good and so that feeling of like joy and also knowing it's going to shift and change and so to like offer it up um yeah I think it's too long. thank you Okay. Um, is this me? You're looking at the computer. 
Yes. Great. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's Leanne. Um, oh, hey there. I know it's been a while. Um, yeah, on the note of Tonglin for yourself, um, I've been having like a really hard time the last couple of weeks of like a lot of just self laceration. And, um, and I've been listening to Tara Brock's book, Radical Acceptance, where it's a lot of yes. it is like, and I'm like clinging to every word. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. It's like my lifeline while I'm like weeping about how like I've screwed up my whole life and blah, 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 blah. And like, I just, um, I feel like a real visceral, violent resistance to mm. able to extend self-compassion. And I like can yeah. cognitively know that that is what's required and could be helpful. And I get into these moments or swirls where it just feel like I can feel it in my chest where it's like uh uh and yeah. I'm just wondering yeah when when you're sort of like really in it um and it almost just doesn't feel available <laughs> like yeah. what what yeah. else there is? yeah um first of all and sending you a big hug from over here I'm really sorry you're going through that I um, definitely know those low moments um and glad you're coming to practice you know in the kind of apothecary of how the four measurable practices are taught right so we have loving kindness compassion empathetic joy equanimity they they actually have these suggestions of what do we do what if i can't access compassion and empathetic joy so instead of trying to find what's good in yourself notice what is good in the world now, this can be tough if we start comparing ourselves like, oh, that's good. They're good. I'm terrible. More just like rejoicing in the sunlight, through the trees, rejoicing in, you know, the life of Nelson Mandela. Like it really can be anything that lifts you mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to like, because, yeah, you can't force it. Um, so that would be one thing I'd really recommend is bringing in that rejoicing practice. I think kitten videos in are included in that. I've been watching planet earth. It actually really helps. <laughs> exactly. It's totally a rejoicing practice. And, you know, and that sense, and the other piece is to um, kind of, you were saying there's like this resistance sounds very, you know, cognitive and, and trying if possible to feel whatever can be feeling good in the body, warm shower, sunlight, breeze, really the coffee. So it's not that like, you know, um, I am feeling compassion for myself, just the natural ways you're already kind to yourself and really savoring that. Mm. So, yeah. Hope that's, that's awesome. hope that is of, of support. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, I have had two times where I find it particularly hard to find self-compassion. And uh, and I just wondering what do you have like a tip or something to move past that? And it's um uh, when when I make a mistake that gets in the way of me having something good. So it's like if whatever action uh I I took I would have done the opposite or like not done it or something. Like mm. I literally think it would be objectively much better, you know, and just uh, sitting and accepting that <laughs> that your situation is just not good or bad, you know, and I be like, oh, I'm going to have so much compassion, you know, everybody makes mistakes, but I'm honestly in a worse place. Yes. <laughs> and like, I'm just like, I'm, I'm feeling like, oh, that just hurts because, yeah, the yeah. they're bad for people. And, uh, and the second hmm. one, which is I, it might be easier, but it doesn't feel easier. If I'm just very either physically tired or just, you know, like my body's not feeling completely okay, then almost this either empathetic joy or compassion just doesn't seem available to people. Totally. Yeah. Um, so in the first one, I want to make sure I get it. So when you've made like a mistake of some sort, yeah. and then as a result, things are not great or oh, bad oh really bad yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
whatever. It, and it doesn't like, you know, it's not that like it harms others, but it's more like, yeah, whatever it's paid for and that's what it's paid for. Right. And it's just like objectively and there's no way of putting, like, you know, like whining, yeah. like going back. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Like, Often yeah. Would an example be like, um, I stayed up way too late watching this or reading that, and then the next day I feel terrible? That. Yes, but I think, I, I mean, I definitely could be caught up in those ones. Like, yeah. I call them like full regret. I feel like I'm more like ruminating. But right. For those, I do feel like the like a little sexy. Yeah. It takes a long time, but I can feel self compassion. But if it's like, uh, I don't know, I thought. I shouldn't have married this person. Just kidding. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah well, <laughs> like yeah, big. Maybe, Not in your case, yeah, I'm just saying. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you drop the sex with you. And uh, for some reason, you like, either, either your ego gets on the way. And you end up like getting on a fight with the person. Like, and then you just walk away. And you're like, I just ruined my life. And wow. So, uh, okay. Then. How do you respond? Yeah. It's like every day you're like, oh, I just have my ACL job. I just have to I did that. <laughs> wow. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I see some heads nodding. So I think you're not alone um, in that experience. And, you know, it's interesting because I think there's a couple things caught up in it. And, um, you know, one is really like this kind of delusion, right? That we actually have control. We might show up to this job and kind of not blow it and do great and then get the job. And the job sucks, actually. Not our dream job. So it's this kind of fixation on something being better. You know, like this other thing, it would have been better, but I didn't I didn't do it. And you know, so it's like, I don't know. I think recognizing it would almost be like the the kind of fourth of the preliminaries, like no single thing that we want or think would make our life that much better is, is actually true and that's like a tough one because they're like yeah but like it would be really nice to you know have chosen this other thing I think it would at least be a little better but the fixation on it it's a grasping right so it's okay to recognize and feel like I made a mistake and I, I should have done something different but I think those cycles right that fixation can just be helpful for us to apply a little bit of that discerning wisdom of like don't know how it would have been. I'm not actually sure. You know, I think that one, um, I think that one can help. And I do think it is tough because we might not be able to directly meet that sense of doubt or regret or frustration. Like that might be like a weed we want to pull out, but also we need to be like planting the other seeds of feeling like, you know, so not directly like I love myself, even though I made this mistake, but I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. I made this mistake. Does that make sense? So yeah. it's like planting the other, like really savoring the things we do where we feel like we're in alignment with our values. Um, we're in alignment with how we want to be in the world so that we can kind of balance out the fixation on the ways that, I mean, man, do we make mistakes, you know? The regret is the trap. And the regret, I think too, at least speaking from my own experience, is an idea that I have more control than I do, you know, on how things are going to turn out. Like, it should have been that way. I could have done this. It's like, well, maybe. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's, that's what comes up. And then um, the, the first one was the, what was the first one? You said the, oh. Yeah. But better for how long? Everything changes, you know? So again, that fixation on like somewhere that isn't here would be so much better. It's a delusion. Um, it's not totally delusion because qualitatively part of it, but that it would like sustain you forever and would be the source of your enduring happiness. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. What was the second one again? Oh, yeah. But you need naps are important. <laughs> I think people try to meditate when they're really tired and like, I don't recommend it. I don't do it. 
it's terror. It's like really painful to try to stay awake when you're in and laying down. I've mentioned this before. Laying down meditation is amazing. Give your body like that rest in the infirmary posture. But if you're too tired, definitely go to sleep. It's really nice. The book that Chandra will start next week. There's all these practices of visualizing your body as light while you go to bed. Great. You can do that. It's a practice and um, like a different way of healing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try to make my way through six paramitas rapid fire. Um, we, we don't have to get through all of them, but they're so nice. So again, generosity, discipline, patience, joyful effort, mindfulness, and wisdom. It's funny because I think that a little bit of what came up even in people's challenges with self-compassion, developing these qualities is like part of what can really help us feel a sense of care and coherence towards ourselves. I spoke quite a bit on, on generosity last week, but I, I just wanted to share, there's another part here that um, Sokni Rinpoche talks about um, that I think is so beautiful. Um, he's just saying that this generosity isn't necessarily, and obviously it's not like a Buddhist quality. It's something that's already rooted in our heart. And, you know, when we think of um, gen generosity, I think it's this real amazing way for us to also practice, as I mentioned last week, not getting so kind of self-fixated or self-absorbed, giving it away helps us overcome kind of like that mental poverty of like, there's not enough. Like, oh, there's not enough, right? Like, I'll just give away what I can. And if I give it away, I start to really have a sense of, oh yeah, things are just given away and then they come back and then you give them away and gets you kind of in more harmony with the natural flow of reciprocity. And yeah, it's really beautiful. Some of you probably know Robin Wall Kimmerer and her writings um, around this idea that approaching, especially the natural world, but also our relationships with one another with this reciprocity feeling. So when we are receiving something, whether it's like a fresh apple from the tree or a smile from someone we care about, feeling the sense that if we receive it with a sense of appreciation, we naturally are inclined to give back. Our generosity is stoked. So it's that kind of coming and going relationship. Um, and then discipline, which again is always so confusing to people. Um, they think it means like rigidly practicing, um, but discipline here is ethics or morality. Um, and I really love this. He says um, the harmful mental tendencies. So the discipline is essentially how non-harming can we be? How non-harming in body, speech, and mind? How much can we not self-lacerate or be unkind to ourselves? And this includes things that we're doing, but he says the um, harmful mental tendencies are also what are called wrong views um, or inappropriate views. When we're holding wrong views, we're holding something as true that is not true. Um, and in the preceding pages, we have come to see how much pain and confusion is generated in our own experience when we hold certain ideas about ourselves, we see how limited our choices become when we see our patterns as true. So practicing discipline involves continually working to find space in our patterns, to find the gaps in the images we hold about ourselves. It also means finding the gaps in our ideas about others, releasing images that we hold about a manager, a coworker, a friend, or a partner. Really love that, that discipline, you know, of course, of non-harming to ourselves, um, but to be so specific is, you know, I'm always that way. I, I can't believe I did that thing again. And to find, as he's just saying, some gaps, some space in that view. And then, of course, the generosity we can extend to how we see others. They're always that way, right? Where, where is the spaciousness and the generosity actually bringing that forth um, that we can have with them. The real meaning of discipline, maintaining love, maintaining the hope that every living being will awaken, even in the most difficult conditions. I love <clears throat> the real meaning of discipline, maintaining love 
and maintaining the hope that every living being will awaken, even in the most difficult or challenging conditions. Pretty inspiring. Uh, patience, I think this is such a hard one. And I always joke that I would love to teach a day long on patience, but nobody would show up. Um, but it's, it is so important. I mean, I don't know um, what could be more important. And, you know, we develop it in our meditation practice through meta awareness, right? Like recognizing I want to, you know, kind of get up and go get a cup of tea. Oh, but we're still meditating. Okay, here I am, right? Or maybe noticing ourselves, like, planning our dinner or lunch and then oh, oh I'm here and that's a kind of way of starting to develop that capacity because one of the biggest parts of patience is just like impulse control right I want this not good for me okay <laughs> right like oh um and especially I think it's you know really hard um and Sokni talks about this Shanti Deva talks about this the patience that we practice when someone is being toxic towards us. Accusing us of things that we didn't do, being mean, being just cruel in other ways, and being patient to not retaliate in that moment, to give ourselves a little bit of space so that we have the opportunity to respond with compassion. I don't know what is harder. Definitely not a skill I see trending around our political environment right so important developing this quality of patience and it's i don't know you know have you all noticed that when you you know when you at like the figurative term bite your lip like when someone says something and you're very angry and you don't respond it feels like your body's on fire and you're like is there actual smoke coming out of my ears like it's a visceral process sometimes this patience and the other form of patience is kind of an endurance. Can I keep getting on this cushion every day, even though it's hard, I feel resistance, there's like other things I wanna scroll or do, right? Like, can I actually keep my motivation um, and, you know, avoid that call to other, other things? It's really, really hard. Um, and then the last form of patience, so it's the um, the impulse control, the endurance. And then this one, which it's almost like it unlocks the other two. And it's the patience of acceptance. So he says, a third aspect of patience involves accepting the way things are. Many painful events occur in our lives and nothing we can say or do can change that situation. It's a really hard form of patience, right? And that's where in some ways we get the regret, like, wait, no, I need to change. I can change. I got to do something about this. And it's like, not really very like, so our actual window of control over our lives is so pitifully small when we really look at it. So many things are outside of our control and it's nice that the things in our control to do our best. I'm not saying like, just let go and be like a jellyfish, you know, moved by the waves. But I am saying that like this patience with how things are. And I mentioned this last week, but that's what, you know, my teacher says, that's the ultimate generosity with life. Just being patient, like receiving what's being offered. Very, very hard. And again, this doesn't mean we don't vote. We don't protest we don't at any time possible make changes that can be made but or and we also have to accept when we can't um, and I think without that sense of patience we can fall into despair nothing's ever going to change everything's too hard or we can totally burn out in our sense of frustration right so patience workshop forthcoming no one attending. New Year's Eve. I'll make it really appealing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mace and I will be there. And Vanessa. Good. Um, and then the fourth parmita here, diligence, virya, 
joyful enthusiasm. Um, it's my favorite paramita. I don't know if you're supposed to have favorites. It's probably um, supposed to have some sort of even heartedness, but I, I love this. It really motivates and inspires me to like work on this quality of not just like, all right, I'll do what's expected of me. Patience, really important, but let's do this. Like, let's find the joy of bringing ourselves to practice. Like, let's really connect with that experience. Um, so he says the fourth paramita, often translated as perseverance, energy, effort, and zeal. <clears throat> its basic meaning lies in dedicating ourselves with joy and enthusiasm to our practices and to our aspiration to benefit others. Diligence resembles patience in terms of cultivating a willingness, but while patience, um, oops, while patience involves not shying away from challenges, diligence implies an active commitment to taking on the challenges when we commit to helping others. <clears throat> and this is so, so beautiful. Really, I love this image. He says, it is said that the diligence is a kind of armor that helps us face challenging situations. And it's that it is consistent with the image of a bodhisattva as a kind of warrior or hero. But we must remember that this kind of warrior or hero is dedicated to awakening and fanning the spark in others. The armor that they wear is not some sort of mask, but an outpouring of light glowing from within. That's like the armor of this, um, enthusiasm or diligence enthusiasm is like what our energy is almost like put in front of us with that desire that joyful experience um i think i would love to hear from folks the last are concentration often translated as mindfulness and wisdom it's really important and might deserve its own class so i might pause on it so any any thoughts on <clears throat> the patience, the diligence, and even, you know, uh, the generosity there and discipline? How do these strike people or any thoughts? And Noam, I think I saw something in the chat. Is that true or is that just, okay, cool. Yeah, we were wondering uh, the title of the book. Oh, this is our, um, I think this, did we do this in 2021? Open heart, open mind. Thank you. We're going through best hits of our former books. Mm -hmm. So any questions, thoughts on these qualities? Yeah. Is the, the things that are the actual things that um, uh, but I but I think I think the right answer is that you can be close to the things that happen and you will be able to cope with them. Hmm. The wishful thinking is that have patience of things you can hold to the best way possible and you have an amazing not yes. No, that's a really good, that's a really good, like, discerning there, right? So not patience, like, just be patient, everything's going to work out, right? Uh, but just be patient, because things are just going to be things. And they're going to continue to, you know, come up, come down, come up, come down, um, in ways that we can't predict. And that is where, I mean, unbelievable I'm, I'm sure all of you experience this how much we can engage in a level of self-deception with our practice sometimes when you're like really practicing self-compassion but actually you're not you know you're kind of like you're you're saying it but you're not feeling it um, and you feel that disconnect in how you act in the world and how you do the practices and I think the same can be true we can take these um, practices and ideas on and they might not work and that's why I love this idea of the kind of on the spot or like off the cushion practices and starting with stuff that's simple. So not starting with patience for like the most difficult experiences in your life, but the things, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't know about you all, but I find myself um, often in a rush to get somewhere. Um, and then sometimes I'm not in a rush, but I'm still rushing. And I'm like, 
how? What about just kind of getting there in my own time and like practicing that, right? Which is not exactly patience, but certainly that act of really being present and, you know, being with what's there and kind of going against our natural conditioning that we've built up this time. So if that's, it's like kind of depending on the modes that we're working with. It's like, how do we almost like lean back from those natural habits and patterns and try a different way? Yeah, no, I think that's so true. With the patient's one, we can really subvert it for our own egoic needs. Yeah. Anybody else? I can say, yeah. Um, I just really appreciated uh, the definition that you described with the discipline and patience. I feel like in my life, I would have always thought I'm a little undisciplined. But in that way, it's like I actually have a problem with patience. Mm. I think more so. Mm. Like just that struggle of like just sitting down when you want to do other things. And, you know, like that's really a lot of my struggle in my own personal practice. Right. I just sort of thought that more, but I'm not disappointed. Right. right. Yeah. And so I really, I just feel like I'm going to put it in Maybe I do need that patient. Yeah. <laughs> and we, that the discipline. We all do. We might need a guest teacher, though. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's it's such a hard one. Um, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, these are all terms and schemas, right? Like they're imperfect in a way. But sometimes like going over them and, you know, I don't know how many times many of us have gone through these paramitas, but sometimes it's like, oh, and it really helps, right, to just see that. And, you know, I do think with practice, it is it is really hard to get the tush on the cush sometimes and to, like, make the practice time happen. And we're like, yeah, well, I'm not going to practice. I'm kind of just going to take a walk. It's like, cool, I'm taking a walk. <laughs> it's not practice. Or, you know, it's nice. It's good for you. Um, and it is, you know, it's interesting because for us to have that motivation we also have to be paying super close attention. I have a, a dear friend who I connected with this week and he said, you know, I've been practicing for 10 years. I consider myself a meditator. That's like what I do and who I am. And I haven't practiced this week. And realizing there's such a strong identification with the practice. And he's like, I don't, you know, things have been hard. And I said, well, what have you noticed? He's like, oh, I'm out of control right and I think it's so good for us to really pay attention and notice like what is the bet not like I should there's all these books like it's great I like to really have that motivation coming from you know our own close noticing of our experience wow really wonderful conversation let's take a moment to dedicate our merit here giving ourselves just that moment to come home to ourselves and our breath and our body. And considering the possibility that some of our practice here tonight, our conversation, some of the presence of being together, and it has a sort of energy and a power, some of which we may already know in how we interact with others, some of which we may not be able to account for. And as an act of generosity, we really dedicate any of the benefit, any of that energy that we've created here together. We dedicate that to the hope that all beings could know peace and ease, all beings could find their way home, that all beings would be free.
Thank you all so much. So great to be here with you. And um, Chandra next week, and then I'm back the following week. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you.